Greetings everyone. I'm Don Stacy, unpublished writer. I've been reading from uh, a story, uh, The Division, which is included in Tales of a Bizarre and Unnatural. And I'll continue on with The Division. Let's see where do we live. Now, You folks have been here a while, I expect. We have, the man says, his beard a week out from his last shave. Several months. We're going to undergo the first division we've ever experienced. And quite a ceremony, I understand. Oh, that's all people are talking about these days. You arrived uh, only a week before it takes place. Quite a ceremony, I understand. We all line up at these selection booths. There are ten sites throughout town. Each of them handles you know, 300 people. Each site has an urn filled with black and white uniformly shaped stones. Each person draws out one stone. One, each person has a stone. The negotiations begin. Families want to stay together. Strangers have earnest conversations with everyone. Uh, but ultimately, it's all supposed to work out. For instance, if I draw a black stone and Paula draws a white stone, that means we will be separated unless either of us finds someone willing to trade. But why, you ask? Why must you do this? It's just what we do, Paula said. We oppose giganticism in all its forms. This process assures no village ever grows larger than 3,000 people. The great cities of the past are all empty now. We have brought back life which is unmediated and unformed by the old structures of technology. We have all long been convinced that the old way of living left people isolated, alone, and miserable. You're still a newcomer, Quinton said. You'll gain an understanding of our ways soon enough. The main thing you need to remember is that you must never explain how you got here. Ah, there's our food, and she brought you a plate as well. You begin to eat the rice and chicken enchilada. The woman returns with three glasses of beer. We should show it. We should celebrate, Quinton says. And the three of you touch your glasses together. I'll trade stones with uh, either one of you when the time comes, if you need to, you say. If I can help you stay together, I will. That's very generous of you, Paula says. But it could mean leaving the village and finding a new place to live. Well, I just got here, you say. I have no personal ties with anyone apart from you folks, and I don't mind setting out on a journey to find a small village where I can stay and work. We are meant to walk. Well, why don't you come with us after dinner? There's going to be some speeches tonight commemorating the division, she says. You happily accept their invitation, and... After paying for your share of the dinner, the three of you walk out of town toward the stage. Many people have seated themselves on the hill facing the stage. You follow Quinton and Paula, and soon the three of you find a spot to sit on the slope of the hill. Everyone is talking quietly, waiting for the event to begin. Soon, a man in a long trench coat and fedora jumps onto the stage, and a round of applause erupts uh, from the crowd. The man bows a few times, having removed his hat. To get things warmed up, we have the village string band. And four men uh, leap up from the crowd, climb onto the stage, 
with their instruments and waste no time launching into their first number. They play two more songs and then the man in the trench coat jumps back onto the stage. Let's give these fellows a big hand. Musicians take a few bows and then return to their place in the audience. The announcer then says, All right, folks, now we've come to the main event of the evening. I want to introduce my good friend, the mayor of this village, Samuel Elkhorn. As the audience applauds, uh, a large man jumps onto the stage, shakes hands with the announcer. He steps toward the audience so that the tips of his boots are at the edge of the stage. My good people of, as you know, the division will take place at the end of the week, only four days from now. Half of you will go, half of you will remain. Those of you with children may experience great uncertainty, but we have all chosen to live this way. We have diverged from the past with its blind technological momentum. Our forebears led the way with their great rebellion, which brought on a period of <clears throat> fearful anarchy, countless murders, mass starvation, a horrific time where cooperation was non-existent, and humankind had reverted to a primitive state from which we have emerged only in the last 100 years. We have formed a new culture which is free of machines developed after 1800, free of guns, free of poisonous chemicals, free of nuclear weapons, free of industrial pollution. Our new culture will avoid the flaws of the past. We have developed a means to keep the population in check, but refugees turn up on our streets on a regular basis, and we have limited room. The village cannot handle more people. The well water is replenished by the rains, but only at a certain rate. And the needs of our village can never be allowed to exceed that rate. That is why we have the division. Good luck to you all, he says, and he bows once more and leaves the stage. As the members of the string band, uh, Look back up onto the stage with their handmade instruments. Uh, you look at Quentin and say, The two of you have nothing to worry about. After the stones have been drawn, you'll see what chance has given you to you. But whatever the outcome, you'll be together. You've nothing to worry about. Paula and Quentin look at one another, pleasure on each of their faces. Quentin's face you can read, Paula's you cannot. But uh, for you, that is commonplace, the problem of exploring the intricacies of a woman's facial expression. Unlike you, she has a very good sense of how she seems from up close to across the room. Have you ever been further inland, you ask her? And Paula turns her head to look at you while she answers your question. You gaze into her green eyes, you glimpse their iridescent pattern encircling the black pools in the center. I've never been more than a half a day's walk from here, she says. I was born and raised in a coastal city in my previous life, so I love it here, and I do uh, want to stay here. Surely you understand that, don't you? Well, yes, I can see that, you say thinking of how you grew up around hills and mountains. Too bad this new society of ours doesn't allow bicycles. Only the very rich have them, usually in the form of a rickshaw, Quinton says. But I don't believe there's any law against building your own from scrap. Sure, Paula says. Do you know how many coins you could get for a rickshaw, Sean? You smile. We could drink beer all night, and I'll still have plenty to rip for the road. Now you're talking, Quinson says. Hell, I'll go out there with you to collect scrap. When we go back to town, I'll show you where we live. Then you can 
come get me next time you go out to the scrap heap. Paula says, I've never seen more than one rickshaw in this town. Have you, sweetheart? No, that's the mayor's rickshaw, by the way, Sean Quinton says. Some things never change, you say. Well, if the next one's short, I'll read it as well. I don't really know what story is next. I don't remember. Let's see what the next one might be. Hmm. What was this? Well, this one doesn't seem too long. All right, the formation of restraints. I am trying to become accustomed to the simulated environment of a spaceship taking us to Mars. Today's technology is undergoing an organic, massive growth, spreading into homes with each new device equipped with a programmable chip. Children are taught on computers from the time they begin the first grade, if not sooner, at a Montessori setting or a preschool daycare center. Mothers work these days, more of them than ever before. There is a mother in our ship uh, in which we are to remain for 20 months, nine months to Mars, where we remain for two months before we return to Earth. Simple. The Biosphere crew put in two years in their habitat in Arizona, but then they have more room. The storage of food for an entire crew intended to last 20 months is an enormous amount, but uh, then the ship's steerage is an enormous space, and here everything remains frozen at zero degrees Fahrenheit, a truly uh, astonishing quantity of food. In the room uh, where lower temperatures or refrigeration are not required, we store all the dry goods, rice and grains uh, of several varieties, we grind into flour for bread, dried fruit and vegetables, dried mushrooms and fungus. Of course, the engineering for the simulation and for that of the actual spacecraft are interrelated to some degree. The physical dimensions are identical. In the simulation, weightlessness is not an issue. Gravity continues to perform its effects uninterrupted. The overall exercise of the simulation is that of a prolonged socio-psychological experiment. We each have our tasks. There are only four of us, by the way, two men and two women. Uh, none of us outrank the other. Uh, we are the scientific crew. We are the laborers who gather scientific data and record it into the ship's central computer where the most vital information for the functions of the ship are maintained. We have been selected and trained based on several metrics of character, including altruism, sacrifice, dedication, and lack of aggression. We all have to get along in close quarters for 20 months, and so it is vitally important that none of us are likely to lash out in a fit of aggravation or frustration. It is vital that conversations between each and all of us remain unimpeded by irritation, vexation, or anger. Or, I should not hold off the introductions any longer. First, uh, there is the mother I spoke of earlier. Claire is her name, 37, married with a son in his first year of high school. She is an astrobiologist. The other woman is Velez, a 29, first-rate gymnast. She is both a geologist and a civil engineer. McCroy, or David, 
is uh, both our structural engineer and physicist, and he is also an amateur photographer. Then there's me. I come from a long line of ale makers and pastors. I'm a biochemist with a keen interest in the medical and psychoactive properties of plants. My name's Lars. Each of us has a cabin. The bed uh, folds sideways into the wall, providing space for a desk which also folds out of the wall, like the bed. And there is also a stool extending from a hinged arm which can disappear into the wall as well. <clears throat> During the day we undertake lessons in space navigation even though the flight path of the spacecraft will be completely automated. There are foreseeable circumstances which would require immediate hands-on action, such as the intrusion of an uncharted asteroid across our flight path. Therefore, the uh, manual operation of the spacecraft must be second nature to us by the launch date two and a half years from now. Sometimes it may seem more pleasant and realistic to court failure when it com does come, and it will overtake all of us in one form or another. That may be so on Earth, but life in, space, uh, in a spacecraft disallows such an indulgence. If we do not succeed and return to Earth, we die. If we cannot remain confined now for 20 months and later find ourselves at each other's throats in space, our chances of returning home are greatly reduced. <sighs> hmm. trip to the storm on foot. It's only a 10 minute walk. Although in the winter time it's a bit difficult if there's a, a heavy snowball. It's quite a slog then. Since people don't ordinarily shovel their walks to uh, great alacrity you might say. <laughs> All right, um, so at this time I need to get something off my chest, confess uh, to certain imaginings that could have troubling consequences if put into play. First of all, the les is simply remarkable to look at. These jumpsuits we wear are skin tight, uh, thus her physical contours are reproduced upon the surface of her clothing. I picture the two of us together in a room, or mine, our naked bodies pressing together in a writhing ecstasy. Uh, the flight director has not specifically forbidden us from having sex uh, such should such desires mutually arise, but he has made a few remarks, such as those at the ribbon-cutting ceremony for the simulation building where the four of us now reside on a permanent basis. Just don't date anyone you work with, he said, as he was giving us his send-off, rather vague. He was joking, of course. I suppose he hopes that we will all refrain from the lures of sexual attraction and thus uh, simplify matters to some extent. I, I share this view, which is why I'm setting my confession of desire down for the record. We all perform uh, routine daily tasks uh, which the flight director has laid out for each month of the journey. Some duties require the work of two people and we are paired up in a rotational arrangement uh, through all six possible combinations. Kitchen duty has two people for each meal. When I'm paired with Velez, our proximity, sometimes our arms might brush together, uh, stirs me and we exchange quiet looks. I am making no assumptions about her at all. Both the women are taking birth control pills simply to eliminate their menstrual cycles. Uh, to me it's self-evident that mm, this is a crucial element in the experiment to see if we can all keep a spartan stiff upper lip and refrain from having sex. Uh, yet without specific orders or instructions, what will we do? 
the flight committee must have entertained this question. To say that the woman, um, women uh, were on birth control pills just to eliminate their menstrual cycle, which granted uh, must be a considerable nuisance in space, is obviously a pretext for their intended purpose to render the woman infertile. But then a pregnancy, which uh, had reached the stage of labor pain sometimes during the return journey, could prove highly inconvenient. Putting the pleasant matter of Velez aside for the moment, I must now move on to the apparent growing friction between David and myself. Almost from the beginning, I have exchanged uh, remarks uh, only required by the protocol of a given situation, as though neither one of us wants to waste a single word. He's personable with both of the women, who have made he's far more by the book, uh, within the parameters of training, which basically means rote dialogue. <laughs> <clears throat> we have a recreation time when we can do whatever we like. This occurs after dinner. Claire likes to read novels. I read scientific journals. Velez works out at the gym, a small room equipped with various exercise machines. I have to say I was surprised by this because it was such an extravagance. What happened to sit-ups and push-ups and touching your toes? David likes to watch films and gaze at photographs. Meals and work uh, bring us together. The rest of the time we're mostly on our own. But one day recently, uh, a month into the flight simulation, I went to the gym one night to have a chat with Velez. Through the door's glass portal, I could see Velez running on a treadmill angled upward. Her face was glistened with sweat. I stepped in and shut the door. She shut the treadmill off and stepped onto the floor. Hi, Lars. What brings you around? Surely not the pleasures of exertion. Uh, no, I'm too old for that. Bull. There are marathon runners in their 90s. I'll stick to my sensible morning routine. Look, I, I wanted to talk to you for a bit. You don't mind, do you? No, of course not. I get tired of adhering to our official roles all the time. The ship is such a constant concern. I know, it's like we're in the military, she said. I was never in the military, I said. Me either. What were you working on before you decided to consider for the Mar uh, be considered for the Mars project? I was doing research for a paper about the geological signs of the presence of lithium ore. Uh, one night I was reading the newspaper, one of the flight director's op-ed pieces caught my eye and I was hooked. Uh, that one he wrote about the challenges of constructing a base on Mars. Oh yes, I read the same article when it first appeared. You might call it one of his uh, recruitment efforts. I wonder what else he did to draw in the scientific community. After all, we were his target audience. Well, he went on uh, speaking to her. Uh, when he came to our university, I went to see him. I'm going to turn a few of you into astronauts, he said. He had this astonishing confidence, I thought. Yes, he does have that. He, he's, he's not troubled by needling doubts of inferiority, not that guy. His guiding aim is to orchestrate a successful flight, she said. He has to take so much into account. Rumor is, he seems to listen to those around him very carefully. He's never dismissive of someone else's opinion, so I've heard. Yeah, I've heard that too, she said. Pause took effect here in our conversation, and soon she said, Well, I need to take a shower, Lars. Nice talking to you. See you at lunch duty tomorrow, then, I said. Say, did you ever wonder why the flight director decided against a 20-month supply of prepackaged meals? We're not going to be baking bread in space. Well, my guess is that he wanted to ease us into this regimen of life in space without going the full mountain. Yeah, maybe so. That's it.